And I've entitled the message today, When Dreams Collide. When Dreams Collide. August 28, 1963, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, was perhaps the, the greatest message sermon ever spoken about dreams. And of course, it was Dr. Martin Luther King, the I Have a Dream sermon. And he indeed ha had a dream. Now, a little known fact, and th those of you who are close enough to Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, know this, is that his I Have a Dream speech was actually first given down the street uh, in Rocky Mount in November of the previous year. A uh, slightly different version, a bit longer. The one that was spoken in D.C. Uh, had, had gone through some iterations, but that message was first spoken down in Rocky Mount. Uh, there's actually a bust of Dr. King that's in one of the parks there. But every one of us, we have dreams. Maybe they're not as, as big as what Dr. King saw in the 1960s. But we all have dreams, desires, ideas that at some point become really part of who we are. I think we all would agree, agree with that. They, they, they form, if you wish, a philosophy of life that somehow we begin to operate in. And if you're like I am, I had dreams. Please notice the past tense. I had dreams of a full head of hair. I had dreams of being smart someday. I had dreams of being athletic someday. I had dream. Not I have a dream. I had a dream. Are you with me? And so some of us are old enough now we realize it was Jesus that kept us from having some of those dreams fulfilled. How many of you were in love when you were in high school? How many of you know how God didn't let you have that dream? Come on. Because that dream would have become your nightmare. Come on. And so there was some dream. I had a dream. I mean, I, you know, there, oh, never mind. I, my wife of 44 years is sitting here this morning, so I'm not going to go too far there. Big sip. Okay. All right. No, I am not. I had a dream. I, in high school, I, I did radio broadcasting and really thought that, that between that and, and I wanted to be in the recording industry. So I had interviews with both RCA and Columbia in Nashville, Tennessee when I was 15 years old. I got on an airplane, went out there, interviewed, and they said, if you want to do this, come on out here. We'll put you to work sweeping the floor and maybe somebody will not show up for work and we can slide you in someday. That's how it worked. Came home, told my mama, you know, I'm leaving high school to go into Nashville. She said, over my dead body, boy. You know, you're going back to school on Monday. All right, you know how that works in the South. That was another dream that didn't happen. Well, then I thought, well, maybe I'd like to be a musician. I could be, I'd, like, I'd love to be a professional musician. So I go off to music school, and I meet this marvelous woman here. I mean, that was, and so the professional musician thing, it didn't happen either. Uh, absolutely. And what a wonderful exchange it's been, let me just tell you. And yet, interesting enough, I never dreamed of being in full-time ministry. It was, not, it, was, it was not in the database anywhere. I never dreamed of doing that, yet watched how God pulled a thread, whether it was the music part, whether it was the learning how to speak on the radio part, whether it was all of these various experiences and, and if you wish, my dreams, that somehow God, Dreamweaver, managed to put all of these pieces together to get me in the midst, right in the center of His will. Amazing. So it begs a question for you and for me, what, what are our dreams? What are our dreams? We're taught, follow those dreams. Come on. It's not like a Disney moment. Chase that dream. Run after that dream. There's only one problem. 
it's not biblical. You know, I begin to look at this and realize that God never tells us to chase a dream. God never tells us to follow a dream, does he? He says in John 10, my sheep listen, I know them, and they do what they follow me. We don't follow a dream, we follow the voice of the shepherd. Very interesting that we hear this. Ephesians 5 goes on and it says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. How many of you know because by means of the Holy Spirit who now lives inside of you and I, that we are without excuse not to know the will of God for our life? Oh, I just want, oh God, what you read your Bible and talk in tongues. Just giving you some advice this morning. Just break it down, all right? And I'm not talking about clicking off your spiritual disciplines for the day. Done, going to work. No, 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 no. I'm talking about keeping in step with the Spirit. Let God direct those paths. Amen? But we all have these dreams, and even if they're not grandiose or, or they're out of reach, we all have these ideas, these constructs of what life should be. My wife and I, in, in, in our household growing up, I know there are spiritual households where they spoke to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and, you know, they, they, they quoted scripture to one another. We quoted movie. You, you with me? We, we quoted movie quotes is what we pretty much did. And, and of course, if the greatest, one of the greatest movies of all times, of course, is Tombstone. Now, ladies, you just got to hang on with me just for a second because I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to go to that, that dark side of my chromosome mix, all right? But, but I'm your huckleberry because of some of the greatest lines in that movie that exist right there. Let me just tell you, that's a man movie. But there's this scene where Doc Holliday is dying. Wyatt Earp is at his bedside. And they're having this discussion. And Wyatt asked Doc Holliday, Doc, what is, it, what is it that you really want? And he said, Wyatt, I just, he says, no, excuse me, Doc is asking Wyatt. He said, Wyatt, what do you want? He said, I just want a normal life. And he says, Wyatt, he said, there's no such thing as a normal life. There's just life. And yet it's amazing how every one of us, when we talk about normal life, even if we're not talking about grandiose things, we still have a dream. We still have an idea of what our normal life should look like. And many times we even hold up that construct in front of God and ask God, I want you to bless my idea of a normal life. How many of you here realize how uninterested Now, let me say, God is vitally interested in you, but God is amazingly disinterested in somehow coming and affirming and blessing your idea of what your normal life should look like. I don't know about you, but my life looks nothing like the life that I probably would have constructed for myself. And most of you in this room, it's exactly the same way. You ever looked over at your life or your wife and said, I can't even believe this. And she's been looking at you like that way for 10 years. Because given your own designs, you probably would not even have made that selection. And yet God in his sovereignty and his grace, his mercy, puts you with that spouse. Amen? A normal life. But what happens when life collides with our dreams? But what happens when our dreams collide with God? Now, let's look for a moment. What is a dream? Well, if we look at the components of a dream, they're made up of some combination of recollection, imagination, and revelation. Let me say that again. We're talking about now the stuff that dreams are made out of. Recollection imagination, 
and revelation. Now, <clears throat> I got out of high school chemistry with a D minus and a prayer. <laughs> See, I got goofed up because I thought it was a science course. It was math. I got lost in math in the eighth grade, teach, and I was done. I was cooked. So chemistry, was it was over for me. I thought we were going to blow stuff up. But the reality is, you know that there's certain chemical compounds that if you put them together in the right proportions, it works. But if you get anything sort of out of kilter, out of the right proportion to the next, you can create something with the same ingredients, but it becomes either caustic or even explosive. You realize the same thing happens in the components of a dream, of where we weight our dream. Do we weight it on the basis of recollection? Do we, do we base it more in the realm of our imagination, or are our dreams primarily geared and weighted toward revelation? And invariably, every dream that we have is going to be a combination of those three things. But it's critical for us that we get them in the right proportion. Then we find that there's the life cycle of a dream. So many times we think, if I can dream it, then the next step is the realization of that dream. Oh, my goodness, let me just tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, there's the conception of a dream. That conception, if it's what we're talking about this morning, is being ordered and ordained by God. It begins with God saying, and God said. Revelation, conception of a dream. Then there's the gestation of a dream. It's that moment between God speaking it and it coming into realization. And that gestation, we call that faith. The assurance of things, what? Unseen. Then there's birth. That's when that dream, finally, there it is. You know, the little burrito is finally there. Birth, visibility. Then there's maturity where there's a season of fruitfulness. And then there's death. See, this is part of the dream cycle is that we think that the dream gets to a place of, 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 of maturity and fruitfulness, but in reality, every dream comes to a moment of death. Why? Because as a principle of death before resurrection, if God's got anything to do with it. But here's the good news. Any dream that God has conceived, He will resurrect. Some of your dreams need to die. You know why? Because you got baby daddy problems of the source of the conception of that dream. God says in Isaiah, do I bring to the moment of birth and not bring delivery? God will safely deliver that which he conceives. Not only that, God will also resurrect that which he has allowed to die around your life. And let me tell you, when you see a dream and you allow it to die and you allow God to resurrect it, then you got something going on. And then last, and then dreams. Are they divine or are they human? You know, God does not dream. And can we just talk about just kind of the nature of God for a moment? How many know that God doesn't dream? It's nowhere in the Bible. And yet, He determines. There's a difference. You see, God has never been motivated by dreams, never been motivated by hope, never been motivated by his emotions. God has always been motivated by his plan, by his providence, that which he has determined in advance. You see, a dream has an uncertain outcome, doesn't it? I mean, there's a, very, there's a lot of variable, but when God says a thing, that's the end of it. Everything in between are details at that point. And this is why when we move from just operating in, our, in the realm of our dreams, but we move on the basis of the Word of God. Why? Because it says that His Word will never return to us, what? Void. So once we know that we know that we know that God has said a thing, that's the end of it. And then all the variables that are subject to the process of what we would determine to be a dream all of that gets set aside. But God operates on the basis of his plans. 
Jeremiah 29. I mean, if we don't know any other Bible, we know that one. I know the plans I have for you. And we also know, you know, that, what, what was that? Um, oh, shucks. Prayer of Jabez. We got that one too, all right? You can buy those at the service station now. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. Psalm 139, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So we know then that if we know that we're made in the image of God, in Mago Day, we're not trying to just become a better version of ourselves. But God is wanting to transform us, not just modify our behavior. But he's wanting to transform us, and transformation is only possible by means of the Holy Ghost. But if we want to step into being less like us, more like him, that Imago Day, then how God operates needs to become our modus operandi as well. Not just on the basis of what we can think, what we can dream, what we can blog, what we can post, but on the basis of God, what have you said? So these are the components of the dream. But So what happens, though, when dreams collide? And let me just give you just a handful of ideas. Number one is to consider what inspires or sources our dreams. My wife and I bought a timeshare. It's a little bit like saying that you were in Amway. And if you're in Amway, God bless you. I trust you. I trust that you are quadruple aluminum or whatever the, go, the, the, the things are now, okay? But Mike knows what I'm talking about. I mean, we went through the day, we did our, we did, we, t- we spun our circles, you know, and we were, we were soap millionaires, okay? But my wife and I bought a timeshare. You know, it's almost like one of those things that you, you know, you don't want to talk about what you did in high school. <laughs> So, but we did. But you remember the pitch. If you've ever sat in one, you know, three nights, two days free, just come listen to her. But the pitch is selling you an idea of what you deserve. Imagine your family on the coast. Imagine. Haven't you worked hard enough? Don't you deserve this week that you will be paying for until Jesus himself comes again? And once you get it paid for, you will have maintenance fees into eternity. But they set up a comparison that everybody else is having this amazing life. I mean, think about this, what social media is about. Here's a picture of my food. While you're eating another peanut butter sandwich on Piggly Wiggly bread, I'm not talking about good bread. I'm talking about the the three, four dollar bread. You know what I'm talking about. And they're taking pictures of their great big piece of cow on the plate at Ruth's Chris or something like that. And so all of a sudden now it's, this collision of how they're doing their life, how you're doing li- your life, and the comparison creates this dissonance at best, but it creates this discontent and this accusation against God at worst. My goodness, what has happened to my dream? And that comparison, kids, it's just a euphemism for envy. I'm sorry. hate to break it down for you quite like that, but it's all it is. It's envy. Exodus 20, I mean, right out of the box, here's the big 10, don't envy. James 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you, stuff you can't have. Wow. And wow, I, and, and, and God bless, God bless Amazon. You, you know, you're looking through Amazon, you go, I didn't know they made that, Pastor Blake. Now that I know they make it, I want it. Not only do I want it, I need it. Come on, baby. Amazon Prime, my friend. Click. And you didn't even know it existed three minutes ago. But now your life is on hold until the UPS man 
knocks on your door and fulfills that dream. Wow. Getting hot in here. Because it's the American dream. Not just American, it's American dream. Back in the day, our mothers got the, got the, got the they were called magazines. They were paper things, and they got, and they subscribed, and they came. And so if you're in the South, and you are a Southern woman, you take Southern Living Magazine, correct? I mean, I'm sorry, but it's part of having your South card. Is that if you are a female in the South, you take Southern Living Magazine, and I might add, you also get the annual cookbook. <laughs> Collect all 5,000. But then they also, there was another magazine called Better Homes and Gardens. But you know what, realized that it didn't say, it wasn't homes and gardens. It was better homes and gardens, implying that theirs were better than yours because they set you up to compare, dang, their house looks great. Mine looks like a bunch of banshees ran through here. And that's called children. None of these people have children, by the way, that took these pictures. But now, we're more sophisticated. We're connected. We've got HDTV. Better yet, Pinterest. And if you're a man in this room and you've got a Pinterest account, come on down here. We'll pray for you at the end of the service. But you see, all these suggestions, they fuel our imagination. The advertising industry, it creates that comparison. It creates that envy. I mean, come on. So the Apple 56 is going to yield to the 56S or the 57 Pro. And by that time, there'll be $10,000, but it won't matter because we got to have it. You know why? Because the edge is brand new. <laughs> it's been reimagined. And yet, every one of us have drunk the Kool-Aid. You know what I'm talking about. But all of these sources, they fuel something in our imagination of what the normal life should be like. But what if the life that God has ordained for us collides with the life we want or think we deserve. Stay with me. Second point, i got to move faster. Do our dreams most often have us at the center rather than God? Joseph, that dreamer. Genesis 37. I mean, let me tell you. Joseph's Joseph. He's the man. I got all that. He was an idiot. Adolescent. I mean, who comes to their brother's? And shares a dream like that. I mean, even daddy winds up rebuking him. Now, he remembered it, but I mean, you remember the dream. You know, I saw the stars, and they were bowing down. He said, you have lost your mind, boy. And it's not too much longer that the brothers, out of envy, as you know, he winds up, Joseph winds up getting sold into slavery. And the next decade or so of Joseph's life, they're pretty ugly. They really are. But you see, Joseph got in trouble trying to operate in his own dream. But by the time we get over to Genesis 41, by the time that he is ushered into the presence of Pharaoh, he interprets the dreams that Pharaoh has. God gives him a spirit of wisdom and application to know what to do to save the known world from famine. We find that when Joseph begins to operate in someone else's dream, God begins to do something with him. But when God was intent, when he was intent on trying to operate in his dreams, it got him nothing but problems. Let me just tell you, some of us need to begin to operate in a dream other than just ours. Wow. What do I want? How do I position myself with God to get it? Certainly God will breathe on my dreams because after all, I'm a son. He's a good father. He's obligated to perform. Years ago, I asked my grandfather for a 22 rifle. I was seven or eight years old. You know, had the 
had the Red Ryder BB gun, but just didn't quite get it done. You know what I'm saying? Because the bullets were so cool. And I was the only child of an only child. So imagine, all I had to do was be in the same room and think it. And it telepathically, it, it would appear. All right? Yeah, I was rotten. But I remember at seven or eight years old asking for a 22, and he said, absolutely not. It was the first time that this grandfather had ever told me no for anything. And yet, looking back, recognizing the lethal potential of that weapon in the hands of an idiot seven or eight year old, the best thing he could do with my dream of having that weapon was to tell me no. Now, I see I can't preach this message in other places because, you know, we're in the South and guns are okay. So this is not a diatribe about gun control. Can we not go there? All right? This is a kid with a BB gun. All right. But he told me no. Why? Because he realized the danger in saying yes. Is God, number three, central and essential in our dreams? Abraham and Sarah were just looking for one kid. Just one. And yet, God comes back, Genesis 17, 99 years old, making you very fruitful, father of many nations, to the point, I'm going to have to change your name from Abraham to Abraham so that you can reflect that which is my design and destiny for your life. I don't care that you're 99. All that matters is that this is the course, this is the tra trajectory I've had you on. And imagine the heartache in Abram and Sarah after all of those years of faithfully walking with God, yet to be childless. Yet God had something so much bigger in mind that just got Abram, Abram and Sarah out of the center and got him at the center. I'm going to do this through you. And you begin to look at all of, the, all of the, ab, the, the eyes here. Listen to this. I have made you a father. I will make you fruitful. I will make nations of you. I will establish my covenant. What is central is not God just coming and affirming something for this precious couple. But I will. I have. I know. It's God getting back into that place of preeminence. Yielding our dreams. As an act of worship. Oh, you need to dream bigger, Pastor Jim. You need to bring, move just beyond just a local church or a city or a state or nation or the nations. That's a wonderful thing. And we need to dream bigger, yes, but is he a bigger God and do we truly trust him as such? Asked another way, do we trust God with our dreams? Or is it mine? My precious. Do we trust God the same way that Abraham had to take that one boy up that mountain to kill him? And don't kid yourself, this was not a five or six year old child. This was a grown man who walked up there under his own volition. He knew what the journey was about. And hear this amazing promise that God has made. And it's just like, God, if I kill this one kid, how does that work? My only, how do all of these promises work themselves out through our family lineage, through my loins? If I kill him. Wow. Do we trust him enough to yield our dreams? You know, I find many times if I get really honest with me and get honest with God, I don't. But you see, it's not just an issue of not getting the stuff. It's an issue of I'm not sure how much I really trust him. I'm not how much I really trust Abba, Daddy, to give me exactly what I need in the moment that I need it. Understanding that a moment before would bring leanness to my soul and would ruin me. Because you see, when we're dreaming right, this is my last point. A dream is a longing fulfilled. We find this old man in Luke. And I can say old man now with a whole lot of affection. 
Some of you giggle, that hurts me. Luke chapter 2, we usually quote these verses around December, but there was a a man named Simeon, righteous, devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, Holy Spirit upon him. Mary and Joseph come to dedicate the child. Simeon took him in his arms and saying, God, as you've promised. Now talk about a dream. Talk about a dream. You won't die until you've seen the Messiah with your own eyeballs. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. You see, the right revelation, the right dream, will produce a fulfilled rather than a failed expectation. Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. You see, many are heart sick today. Why? Because they're hoping both in and for the wrong thing. Because their dreams have been largely weighted toward their own imagination rather than God's providence and God's revelation. Wow. And you see, even the Messiah's appearance, most missed him the first time he appeared on the earth. He didn't come right. I mean, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and said, you're the very ones that study the scriptures that testify about me, yet now that I'm here, you refuse to come to me. They didn't see it. They didn't get it when he showed up because their dream, their paradigm of who this Messiah was going to be, what he was going to do. Certainly, when he comes, he's going to walk into Washington, D.C., and he's going to clean house. What if he doesn't? And I want you to hear this. Many of us are really sensing that we are on the verge of historic awakening on the globe. I'm talking beyond first and second great awakenings because they were geographically constrained. But God is doing something on a global order right now, which to our natural eyes seems absolutely chaotic. It seems like he's out of control. Listen to me. God is plowing the ground for harvest. I want you to hear this. I don't remember if it was Tozer or Ravenhill, but made the statement decades ago. And I quote one of them. I'm sorry I can't remember to find the quote now. He said, my biggest fear is that as charismatics and Pentecostals, we know so much that we're in fear of missing the next move of God. We're in fear of missing it. Because we're in, because we're in danger of missing it. Why? Because we, we all have our own paradigms of when Christ comes again, when revival comes, this is what it's going to look like politically, economically, personally. This is, but what if? That God begins to send the reign of revival. What if that revival is already sitting in our churches? What if the source, the headwaters of revival, is the Holy Ghost on the inside of you and God is waiting for a bunch of individuals to turn on the faucet of God in their life and letting the collective rivers of God come forth like an Ezekiel 47 river that will begin to change everything it touches. I mean, we're looking for revival to come from molting angels or, or, or filled teeth or jewels. Or, and we've got these wild concepts of what revival is. But what if God chooses to do it in a way that we don't even like it? Because so many times we personally hijack these ideas of how this is going to affect me when God is always looking beyond. Amen? Wow. Revival. And God fully intends to exceed your expectations. You know that. You know that to him who is able to do immeasurably more, Ephesians 3.20, you know this. If we'll allow our dreams to collide with his determinations, then we begin to understand a passage like 1 Corinthians 2, 
that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived. There it is. Here are the components of a dream. What God has done what? Prepared for those who love him. Wow. And once we allow our dreams to collide, wow, then we get postured for God to be the father he's wanting and waiting to manifest to us. What have I said today? It's great to have a dream. As long as the source of that dream is God himself. Not some weird concoction, compilation of the advertising industry. Pinterest. What you think, what your mama may have told you but when it's based on what God has said. And when we stop fighting, I got to tell you, every one of us in this room, we've got multiple stories. And in, and in, the, in, in the outworking and the inworking of that dream, it's hurt. It's just been flat painful. And yet, Many times, and sometimes it's decades later, we look back and realize, wow, that was the only way. That really was the shortest distance between two points. Although in that moment, I was changing my eschatology to believe in the rapture. Get me out of here! Are you dreaming the dreams that God wants you to dream? For some of us, our unfulfilled dreams have produced not only anxiousness, but anxiety and even anger towards God. Because he hasn't performed according to our expectations. He hasn't, he hasn't performed according to the dreams that we thought. Some of you even think are dreams that are from God. And God seems to be so delayed coming. Why? God's going to bless that which he has conceived. For some of us this morning, we need to exchange our dreams for his determinations. Begin to pray prayers, not my, not, not my will, but thy will. I don't think that Jesus ever dreamed about crucifixion. Who I'm really looking forward to, Golgotha. I don't think so. But he said, Father, I'll drink this cup. Because he was dreaming beyond himself. He had you and me in mind. Not just what benefited his body or his soul in that moment, but what benefited all of humankind to that day. He was able to relegate his dreams so that you and I Lord Jesus, help us this morning. Lord, we want to declare to you as individuals and as a corporate people, we trust you. You are a good daddy. Even when the answer is no, you are still a good daddy. Only capable. submit our dreams to you today that they might be those dreams that you are inspiring us to have we love you let's just stay in the posture of prayer this morning we don't normally do this but I just felt like we needed to take a moment just right where you are there's some dreams on your heart. There's some things that even the Holy Spirit's putting his finger on this morning. He's asking you to lay at his feet. He may re resurrect it or he may not. It's right where you are. If that's you, just lay, lay those dreams before him.
trust you for very long. we just ask in this moment, this morning, we ask that you would do what's best for us, what's best for your kingdom and your glory, what's best for your plan. We trust you as our king and our God. Lord, the things we don't understand, we lay those at your feet as well. We may never understand this side of glory, but we trust you. Help us, Lord. Help us when we don't understand. To look to the cross and rely on your goodness. We know that you're good. We know that you're good this morning. Have your way. Lord, I also pray, Lord, that you would birth dreams in our hearts, God. Lord, maybe there's some dreams that we um, have forgotten about or, or we have that, have that have died, but you want to resurrect. Lord, I pray that you would breathe on those this morning. This is not about us not dreaming. It's about us dreaming your dream. It's about not just taking away, but replacing. Let me give you my dream for you. Help us this morning. Help us to be sensitive to you, open to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and just worship the Lord as we close. Thank you, Lord. Let's give him a hand this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with us this morning. If you need prayer, if God is on you this morning, or you feel like, man, I just need someone to stand with me, we're going to leave the altar open with some of our pastors and leaders up here. We'd love to pray with you. You guys have an amazing day. If you would, before you leave, check out our, our serving wall in the back. We ask everyone in our church to play some role in serving, right? All of us play our part. Amen. And then if you would want to be a part of uh, uh, preparing for victory, you want to sign up for that on the app, you can. We have books in our resource center in the back. You guys, turn around and greet someone. Tell them you're, they're, you're glad they're here. We'll see you next week.